One. Good evening. We are live. My name is Jay Rothman, and welcome to Real Men, Real Talk Raw. It is a special edition this evening, Thursday evening in the United States. It is Friday if you're overseas, and uh, typically we do come in on Friday evenings, but this week, my guest that's with us this evening uh, was not able to make it tomorrow night, so we are on live this evening, and I'd like to welcome to the studio Greg Million. Thank you. Good to see you. Nice to see you uh, coming in. Greg is coming in live from the country of Canada. I believe you are in Alberta. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yep, Alberta, Canada. Yep. So this evening, uh, what what uh, why Greg is on a show is I was introduced to Greg by my co-host of uh, another show that I do with Debbie called Real People, Real Stories, Raw. And uh, she said, you know, Greg is this guy that you got to check out. He's got a pretty interesting story and platform and the work that he's doing for men. And uh, as soon as I heard that, I was like, okay, what, you know, show me what you got. And she <laughs> sent me some, she sent me some, uh, some of the work that you're doing that you've been doing this, this year and uh, invested some time to learn more about you. And we subsequently had a couple of conversations. And so, here we are. What I'd like to do while we're waiting for some people to jump on is um, welcome those that are watching us live and um, feel free to hit the like or love button if you hear something that resonates with you. And if you have any questions or comment for, comments for Greg or myself, please uh, feel free to, to drop them in your comment section. And if you're not live and you're hitting us on a replay, um, you can also send comments and questions and both Greg and I will come back to you and respond uh, when we are able to. In the meantime, I would like to welcome uh, Bronnie Fisher coming in from uh, Australia. Uh, Debs Deb is coming in from Canada. We've got Tammy McKee coming in, and we have Nicole Marie coming in as well. Uh, please feel free to let us know what country or state you are coming in from. I always love to acknowledge, I'm always so thrilled when I see people coming in from all over the world. We are a global reach show. And so with that, uh, welcome to uh, the studio this evening, Greg. And uh, I wanna thank you for coming in. I understand this is the first time you are doing a live streaming interview here. Yeah, Tommy it is. Actually yeah. coming in from Australia as well. So we are, we are reaching pretty far this evening so far. Wow. And uh, so we at least we've got what three countries that I'm aware of: uh, New, uh, New York, Arizona, United States, and we've got Nicole coming in from Ontario, Debbie coming in from Canada as well, yourself, and then we have two ladies coming in, two guests coming in this evening from Australia. So, having said that, um, I, I'd like to invite you, Greg, to to kind of share with us where you'd like to begin. I'm going to leave it up to you whether you want to start. Uh, from where you were to where you are, or from where you are to going back, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, we're in a safe zone here. If anything should pop for you that you're not comfortable in answering, you can always just say, hey, you know, I'm just not ready to answer that question. So, All right, yeah. I appreciate that, Jay. Thank you. And, and thanks to everybody that's watching or will be watching. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just start from where I'm at right now. Um, uh, I'm, in a, I'm in an incredible relationship with um, a, a beautiful, amazing, and, and wonderful woman who has opened up my eyes over the last couple of years to the opportunities that are present in me accepting and owning my emotional articulation. Um, I've struggled most of my life with being called too emotional or um, trying to, to, to identify emotions as being weak. Um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all the typical or traditional, I guess, masculine attributes that we 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 equate with emotional well-being and stuff. You know, men traditionally aren't good at expressing that. We're not given the tools to express that. So it was a, it was a lot of knee jerk. It was a lot of emotional baggage. Um, I'm the child of an alcoholic. Uh, my mother was an alcoholic when she was alive. She's passed away uh, 13, 14 years ago. Um, so there's a lot of struggle with that as well, uh, still to this day. Um, so this journey of redefining masculinity has always been for me, it's, it's ongoing. It's, it's, it's been something that I've struggled with my entire life. 
you know, I identify as male. Um, that's the gender that I identify with. It's called cisgender. So the gender I was born with is the, the gender that I identify with. Um, so for me, having been a male my whole life and seeing myself as a male, um, I've been given a certain set of what I felt were um, toxic behaviors. Um, you know, things like not expressing your emotions, um, you know, uh, being able to not being able to show those emotions in any way, shape or form, unless it was through aggression or um, some sort of unhealthy behavior, which I found not acceptable. Um, I was told many times, like I said before, that uh, I was too emotional or to get over it or to man up or to, you know, shut up and do it, that kind of stuff, you know, those typical traditional things. So um, for me now, being in a relationship where that's appreciated really opened my eyes up to the opportunity. Hey, what if we were to take a look at this and say, what if we redefine those traditional ma masculine attributes like strength, power, courage, and control? Right. Those are the it, it, that's what I was taught were the, the four key sort of values or attributes of masculinity. So take one, for instance, strength, um, strength, physical strength. Right. Lift as much. Um, we're, we're stronger than everybody else. We're intellectually stronger than everybody else. Um, but what about emotions? How do emotions play a role in the strength? Well, to me, it takes more strength to tell somebody what you're really feeling inside than it does to shove it down. You know, that's that's kind of where I come from with that. To me, it takes more strength and more courage and more power and more control to be able to articulate your emotional state, even if it's just, you know what? Shit, I can't do this right now. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how I'm feeling, but I need five minutes to just think about this instead of just storming out of the room, which is which is traditional masculine way of dealing with things or yelling or screaming or getting angry. Right. So how do we redefine those things? And that's why it's called redefining masculinity. It's because I want to look at ways of taking the traditional attributes of masculinity and redefining them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'd like you to clarify for, for me in the audience, when, when, you, when you refer to emotional, there, there's, yeah. two, there's, there's two thoughts that come to my mind is, well, one is emotional as in a man breaking down and, and, and crying and showing tears. Yeah. The other way of, showing emotions is by a man raging by screaming yep. and yelling and um just in a total meltdown rage and right. uh, so can you clarify what what that means absolutely. To you today yeah yeah so absolutely and that's a good point thank you yeah so i guess to to put a finer point on it what i'm talking about is it is is the idea behind in every situation we have two choices we can either choose fear which is reactive behavior, which is that behavior, the, the, the aggression, the, the anger, the, 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 the hurtful behavior, or we can choose love, right? So choosing love means we come from a place of love. We come from a place of empathy and understanding and compassion for ourselves and for others. So instead of being reactive, instead of, instead of looking at it and going, holy shit, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to punch something. I'm going to look at that and I'm going to say, holy shit, I don't know what to do. And that's exactly what's going to come out of my mouth is I don't know what to do. I'm scared or I'm afraid or I'm lost or I need help. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. So in every situation, you have two choices. Um, and survival instincts tell us that we start from a place of fear, right? Because we're, we're, we're reactive. We're like, okay, um, you know, we're, we're scared or we're afraid of something. And the anger comes from not being able to process that fear. The anger comes from not being able to step out of it, take a look at it and make a conscious, mindful choice to love instead of continue to be in a place of fear, which turns into anger and hatred and, and all of the unhealthy behaviors, the unhealthy emotional behaviors. There's nothing wrong with a man breaking down and crying. In fact, I encourage it. I do it often. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, if I don't do that, my history tells me that I'm going to rage, that I'm going to get angry, that I'm going to that I'm going to yell and I'm going to scream. And those used to be me. That used to be me. I was a, an egotistical, entitled man who thought the world owed him everything because I was too afraid to take a step outside of the fear that I was living in and really, really become mindful of my emotions and become articulate with them in such a way as to be able to express myself. And it's not perfect. I don't get it right every single time. In fact, I don't think of right or wrong. 
I get it as best I can in a situation. Does that answer that question? Does that put a little bit more of a, yeah. a definition to it? Yeah, it, it does. So it leads, you know, for me, it comes down to, you know, one thought that pops for me right now is, okay, so how did you get from, what was the process for you to, well, first of all, was it when you, when you met uh, Leanne, is that when your, your, your healing journey began as far as uh, what you're describing here, or was it happening or process unfolding prior to your current relationship? Uh, the answer to that question is yes, both. Um, I, I was, I've been on this journey my whole life. Um, I'm almost 50. I'll be 50 in a, in a, a little over a month and a half. So I've been on this journey my entire life and I've struggled with my emotional well-being my entire life. Um, uh, right before I met Leanne, I, uh, in my previous relationship, um, we had sort of come to an understanding that we, we were, we were on a road on a path. Um, and Leanne stepped in and we decided that we were going to go on a road and on a path together. Um, and she has allowed, or we have created a safe space for us to be able to express ourselves um, emotionally in healthy ways. Um, so that's been a huge help for me, given permission to be able to express that, not being told to man up or don't cry or get over it, right? And she's been huge in that. Um, but I was on that road probably before I met her. But stepping into that space with her was was a huge boon for me. It was a huge, huge um, step forward in my journey. Absolutely. What do you think? What makes Leanne different than every other woman <laughs> that, that you were in a relationship with? That we, uh, our that truths align. Our truths align like no other. Um, and I mentioned earlier the concepts of right and wrong, right? I don't get it right all the time. And I said that, and I don't look at it like that anymore. I don't look at it like I'm getting it right or I've done something wrong, or at least I try not to. If I step out of the fear and choose love, then I can look at it as my truth. So what I choose to look at like is in relationships, instead of, instead of looking at it like, okay, I'm not getting this right, or I'm screwing this up or I'm messing this up in some way. I look at it like, you know what? My truth is in alignment with the person that I'm, I'm engaged with. So how do I step out of that and do my best to align with my truth so that I'm owning my behaviors and my actions in a mindful, healthy way? With Leanne, um, we have consciously, mindfully created a space for the two of us to be able to do that, which for me has translated into other relationships. So now I can look at other relationships, masculine oriented relationships with my male friends, and I can say those same things both to myself and to them, right? Which isn't something that we're really used to. It's awkward. It's weird. It feels kind of silly in some ways sometimes to say, hey, you know what, man, let's go to a heavy metal show and let's bang our head, but I love you and I really, really, really appreciate you in my life. So how, how have your male friends that you've known, I'm presuming that some of these guys, you know, for a long time, and I'm also going to presume that, that on some level, they have seen a shift in your, in your behavior, in the words you, you use, the words you speak, uh, you have, con you're connecting with them on a level that you had not in the past. A, how have they responded to you? Um, and B, I don't know, like, have they created that safe space for you as well? Or are you just willing to, to put yourself out there and risk um, being made fun of by other men that aren't quite there yet? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, um, the risk is there. Absolutely. But I find that I'm a huge believer in manifestation. I'm a huge, huge believer in the concepts of energy and universal attraction and all of that stuff. So I find that the more time I spend in this space, the more time I spend in this energy and the more time that I, I uh, allow myself to be present and mindful and conscious and emotionally articulate, the more I'm attracting people into my life that way. So what's happened is a lot of the friendships that I had, I no longer I'm strongly connected with. I'm still, they're still friends, but the relationship has shifted. The paradigm between us or the connection between us has shifted. So 
Um, and then I've created new and wonderful and magnificent friendships along the way as well. Um, you and I were talking about work earlier. You know, I work with, with three other men. Um, and it can be challenging at times to express myself emotionally. Um, if I say to somebody, hey, look, you know, I don't appreciate that or I need to be managed this way or this works best for me. Those aren't really conversations that 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 we're used to hearing from men. Right. We're not used to hearing say, hey, you know what? Your actions hurt me or I felt hurt because of this. That's not something we're really used to talking about, especially in a professional environment. Right. Mm hmm. But I'm suggesting that, that we should be getting used to talking about that because that's the core, right? That's where the that's where the the shame starts to happen is if we don't talk about those things, if we don't put them out there, then that shame talk starts to build up and, and all of that, right? So I'm mindfully attracting people into my life that are in alignment with that. And I think that works both ways too. If you're in a negative headspace, if you're in a negative energy, and if you think that the world like I, I used to be one of the most negative, entitled. Uh, I, I often say that I'm a. a I used to be a, 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 a self-obsessed, entitled white guy, you know. And I, I would walk around like the world owed me something because I was in such a negative, fear-based headspace that I couldn't see, or I didn't want to, or I was unwilling, whatever you want to call it. I was unwilling to see how my behavior was causing other people pain and harm. Because I was, I needed to be right all the time. It was more important for me to be right than it was for me to try to align my truth, both with myself and with others. And you know what? Sometimes it didn't align. Sometimes it doesn't align today, and that's okay, right? And that's the difference, I think. Yeah. Does that does that make sense? A lot. Uh, it makes sense. And there's a lot more questions, and I mm -hmm. that's that's coming to me right now. I want to just take a second. I'll give you a moment to breathe. <clears throat> And acknowledge a few guests that have joined us. Debbie Garcia, it is so good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hope you had a, a beautiful holiday and uh, you got a good New Year's coming up. Uh, Mary Kelly, thank you for joining us. Gina Marie, thank you so much for catching us live this evening. And uh, we also have Linda Eubanks coming in from, not quite sure where Linda's coming in from. Feel free to let us know. Um, coming back to, uh, to what we're conversing about, how did you go from where you were besides the fact that uh, Leanne has created a safe space for your relationship, but you're speaking, you're speaking a language. I mean, is it that you weren't, you weren't taught this in grade school and you certainly weren't taught it at home about mindfulness and energy and, you know, all the, all the buzzwords that, yeah. that we speak, you know, like, did you learn this through, did you start to get educated through books or through uh, thousands of uh, thousands of dollars of therapy? Wow. <laughs> yeah, okay. no, I've, I've spent uh, uh, what feels like a lifetime in therapy. Um, I'm a bit of a knowledge junkie, so I tend to read a lot. I tend to absorb a lot. Um, I, I, I've read um, Eckhart Tolle. Uh, Tolle. I've, uh, Brene Brown is a huge influence on me. Um, she, uh, above any other author or, um, uh, emotional advocate or whatever you want to call her, um, was really, really, really powerful. Uh, the, her book, Daring Greatly specifically was a huge, huge impact on me. Um, I love the book. I uh, highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Um, it's, it's fantastic. And that's, that's one of the things that set me down this journey of, wait a minute, holy shit, I've got something here. I'm not as messed up as I, I, I've led myself to believe I am. And that there really is an opportunity here to deal with and work with this shame that I feel over not being good enough, over not doing good enough, over not being the right kind of man. There really is a space in there for that. There really is opportunity for me to speak because if I don't do it, then who, you know, and, and it, the other thing too is, is that this is just as I'd love to say it's altruistic. I'd love to say that I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because I want to change the world. And there's an element of, of change inherent in doing this, but honestly, there's a, a, also an element of, of helping me 
right? The more I talk about this, the more I do it, the more energized I get about it, the more I want to do it. So it's this, this never ending cycle of love and kindness and caring and giving and mindfulness, right? And it makes me a better person. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, so that's huge for me, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'd love to say that I'm doing this completely unselfishly, but truth is I'm not. <laughs> the truth is, is that I want to help other people because it makes me feel good. And it also reminds me, the more I stay in this space and the more I talk to other people about it, and the more energized and jazzed and psyched up I get about it, the more I want to go out and practice this in my own life. The more courage, using the four attributes again, I have to start expressing my emotional well-being to other people, right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. um, I have a saying. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, of, of uh, sort of sayings and, and stuff because it's the way stuff sticks in my head. I have a saying, and it's, it's face it, embrace it, and give it a voice. So first we have to face what it is that we're afraid of or angry about. I believe that there's only really two primary driving emotions, fear or love. You're in one of those. If And typically, if you're not in love, then you're in fear of something. And from fear comes anger and, and all of the other, you know, all of the other emotions. And I'm not trying to to um, uh, generalize, um, you know, mental illness in any way, shape or form, because I, I, I have suffered from chronic depression my whole life. I take medication for it. So I understand that aspect and what that means to me. So I have to constantly be mindful of making that choice, but right, but you face it and then you embrace it. You, you give it a hug. You own it 100% completely as your pain or as your emotional state. And then you have to give it a voice. I feel like I have to give it a voice. And that voice could be literally a voice. It could be writing on a piece of paper. It could be, it could be running a marathon. It could be doing whatever it is that makes you feel like you're coming from a place of love. And for me, that just happens to be talking and writing. Right? Yeah, one of the things that I that I uncovered when I when I finally had the courage to start writing, and for me it wasn't picking up a pen because I never liked my penmanship and that was always a roadblock for me. But when I realized one day that I could open up my phone and go to the notes, the notes app and just start typing, it, I it talk. opened up a whole I actually just it talk into the phone. <laughs> there you go. It opened up yeah. a whole new world for me. But one right. of the things that I learned through my through my writing, my journaling, which then became a pub public blog that I push out. But before I would do that, what I do is I read it out loud, either to myself or to someone that uh, that I trust right. in my life, and. Um, because when I hear myself speak the words that I just expressed through my writing, it really, it, it really hits me. Like, it's not just like, because it's one thing if I, I write it and then I read it and I'm really checking it more for penman, you know, for grammar and all that. But when I hear myself speaking the words that I just wrote that came from my heart from, from within, it just elevates it to that whole, a whole nother level. It's just part of that. It's part of the healing process. Of right. How to express myself. It, 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 it's a beautiful experience. And yeah. uh, absolutely. And so, yeah, I mean, that's the same for me, right? Is reading it out loud or talking about it and putting it down and saying, this is how I'm feeling in this moment, or this is my expression of my emotional self right now, right? That's, yeah. that's powerful. And then yeah. to be able to, like you said, to read that or express that with somebody that you trust. And then by extension, that gives you some level of courage to be able to put that out there for whomever to read, you know? So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a tool. And so you're, you're giving it a voice of, in some way, shape or form. Again, giving it a voice is, it doesn't have to be a voice. It could be anything. It could be any way of expressing yourself um, your, and your emotions as long the caveat of course is as long as it's, it's coming from a place of love and, and you yeah. understand and you embrace that fear because that's where everything starts. My understanding of survival instincts, um, again, from years of therapy and years of trying to research this, my understanding of survival instincts is, is that when we are immediately feel threatened, when we immediately we go into a fear-based reactive place, biologically, that's how we are high, hardwired. So to get away from that, you have to first accept that. 
you have to face it. You have to say, okay, I'm scared right now, or I feel shame, or I, I, I fucked up, or sorry, I screwed up something, right? You know, so you have to do that. You have to give that, you have to take that, and you have to own it, which is what the embracing is. And then yeah. you give it a voice somehow, some way. Maybe it's not to somebody else. Maybe it's just to yourself, right? I call it the three A's. I, there's many different ways to describe what you're describing is the three A's to me is it's awareness, then it's acceptance, and then it's action. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or the exact same thing. Yeah. The other way I've described it with Debbie a number of times on our show is we got to first, we got to first feel it. Right. Then we can reveal it. Right. And then we can heal it. It's right. feel, reveal, and heal. I it's love a, that. Yeah. It's, it's another way to describe it. You know what I also find is when I when I read out loud what I have just written, um, so many times I get emotional. I mean, I literally start to cry in that moment as I'm reading what I had just written, and I didn't I wasn't crying when I was writing it. Right. But it, it just brought it to the whole nother level of of uh of deep emotional feeling. And I yeah. tell you what, it's not there's very few things in life that that allow me to feel that level of just, wow, you know, that release is just beautiful. And until yeah. you experience it. Yeah. In my talks, actually, it's not not uncommon for me to break down and cry, hmm. uh, especially when I'm talking about. Yes. So for me, yeah, for me, my main my main underlying sort of fear based reactivity comes from not being enough. Um, my story as a child was the story of being raised by a single alcoholic mother um, who thought it was best for me to go live with my father and what I referred to as his family, uh, who was my brother and, and my stepmom. Um, so not only did I have, you know, this this unhealthy relationship with my mother, but then she chose alcohol over me. Right. That's how I looked at it for most of my life. And deep down inside, I think I'm still not healed from that. I think still I do that. So for me, it's always never enough. I'm not doing enough or I screwed up or I messed it up because I'm not enough because I wasn't enough for my mom to make a decision to keep me, even though logically as an adult and as a parent, I get it. I understand. She gave me the best life possible. I wouldn't be the man I am today had it not been for that decision, but there's still a part of me when I share this, that breaks down inside because every single time I remember it, like it was five minutes ago. Yeah. Right? You know what? I, I want to acknowledge you right now, Greg, and, and thank you for um, just expressing where, you know, right now, this part of your story, as I, I, I honor you in this moment. And, Thanks. Um, yeah, that's, that's hard to do. It's a, uh, it's it's the primary driver of most of my negative emotional state is that not enough that that feeling like I wasn't worth enough um and and my father and stepmother and they did the best that they could with with what they had and and what they had was a very challenged and emotionally damaged child um I love my mother um we had the opportunity to um reconcile and um she died of cancer and I was there uh, for, I took time off my job to, to basically help care for her while she died for the last seven months of her life. So I'm incredibly grateful for that opportunity. And I've, while I've forgiven the actions um, and I understand why the eight year old boy inside of me still. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He still struggles, right? Yeah. You, you just nailed it. And, uh, I, I, what I want to share with you, Greg, is is what I've had to learn. What I what I have learned along my healing journey for myself um, is that you just said it. Is that that the inner child? I thought that when I grew up and became a man, that my inner child, you know, grew up with me. And what I didn't know is that every time that I got triggered by people, places, and things in my adulthood, it wasn't me as that 30 year old man, that 40 year old man, that 50 year old man, now that 57 year old man, it's, yeah. it's the inner child that's still alive within me. Right. But here, here's what has really helped me on my healing significantly is that 
You see, when I was that child, I didn't, much like yourself, for different reasons, um, when we don't have a parent or parents that are able to love us unconditionally and nurture us the way children need to be nurtured, and the focus is less on us and more on, on the parent, what that does is it leaves us as children learning how to pick up survival techniques and tools. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. That's how we got to the age that we are. We learned how to survive and just get through. And some of us reach a point where we get sick and tired of feeling that way. And we hit a bottom of some sort. And then we are willing to be open to change. And we seek change like you have. Right. But here's the game changer for me, Greg, is that I know today that when my when I get let's say triggered or spun out or impacted by a, an event or an emotion that pops up for me, when I'm able to ask myself in a moment, Jay, how old are you feeling right about now? And when I'm able to like identify like it's not me at that 57 year old man, it's that's me at that eight year old boy or that six year old boy. And what I could do is I'm able to now nurture myself as mm -hmm. the adult version of me. Right. I could now love my inner child who I have nicknamed JJ. And I talk to JJ and I have a conversation with myself and I'm able to help um, remind JJ that he is safe now because I'm here to protect him and I'm here to love him unconditionally. And right. I don't need other people to do that for me. I don't need a dad. I don't need a mom to do that. I don't need a sibling to do that. I don't even need a, a partner to do that. Right. I just need to show up for myself today. And usually when I'm able to kind of work through that type of process for myself and with myself, I find it really helpful. Right. Because I know and, that it's my inner child that's been affected. And it's interesting that, that, Two men are sitting here having a dialogue about inner child and emotional health and all that stuff because it's not common. And that's where the redefining of masculinity comes in. One of the things that really appealed to me when uh, when Deb connected the two of us was the first picture I saw of you. You had a picture on a shirt on that said, choose love. Um, and to me, that's the core of this. That's what this is about. And that's the explanation I think you just gave about having a dialogue with your inner child, right? Men aren't taught how to do that. And no. I'm not saying that women are taught anymore, but there's certainly, within society anyway, more permission given, I feel, to, to women to be able to process and, and talk about that stuff than to men. By, and you asked me this question before. You said, do you feel like it's the women that, that are doing it or putting the pressure on us, or is it the men that are putting the pressure on us? And my answer to that, you remember my answer to the question was? Both. It was both. Absolutely. Because it, it is. I feel like it is both. I feel like we need to allow ourselves to have these dialogues with each other. And we also need to allow ourselves, as inner children, to be able to express those painful emotions in every situation regardless of what the expectation should be and leading to that remove the expectation exactly remove it completely have no expectations express your truth wholly and completely and if it aligns with somebody else that's great if it doesn't that's great too <laughs> right you know that they're, yeah. they're both great outcomes because you've learned something the opportunity is there for for growth the opportunity on both ends of the spectrum right so in any relationship whether it's with yourself whether it's internal or external doesn't matter there's always opportunity for growth and what you just said about talking to your inner child and jj and stuff that's beautiful that's powerful it is it, and I it think changed it's, everything for me greg yeah. it, changed, it really helped me and I think as men, we need to get that word out there to other men to understand that it's okay. It's, it's way more okay than it is to punch a wall or somebody else. It is way more okay to say, I am so scared right now because you intimidate the hell out of me than it is to try to control or manipulate or cajole somebody into doing what you want them to do. You know, like that's just... I feel like it's, for me, it's way more life-giving and love-giving to be able to allow somebody to be themselves fully and completely without expectation.
than it is to try to manipulate or control them. And all the manipulation and the control. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. All the manipulation and control um, come from come from uh, uh, that level of expectation and that eight year old boy stuff, right? Yeah, that makes sense. I, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, we are we are we are we are so aligned right now. Right. That my body is. Uh, I actually mm-hmm. physically, I I feel that that sense of tingling as I've described it before. Good. In this moment, um, which you know, for me, that means that we're connecting soul to soul in this moment. Right. And I appreciate you so much for this. Um, for me, being able to have this physical experience between another man. That's not even sitting next to me. That's <laughs> in, another, in another country. Right. Yeah, um, it's crazy, isn't it? I want to just take a moment here just to acknowledge some more guests that have come on. I've got my sister that jumped in from uh, the uh, the small city uh, just east of me here in Arizona. She's coming in from New York. We've got priceless Princess Jewel who's coming in from overseas. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, Bronny uh, says, "I am here for BJ. Uh, BJ is is uh, Bronny's name. Uh, Bronny was a guest on uh, the show with Debbie and I last month, and we've done some work together, some coaching work um, on a weekly basis thereafter. And in you know, one of the sessions we did together, we we just talked about this whole segment about, you know, I I shared with her how I realized I had I had a lot of nicknames when I was a kid, and none of them were really endearing." At least I didn't feel they were. I only had I had one nickname that I realized was endearing, and it was one that my aunt Sid, my dad's sister. She was the only one who called me JJ. And I realized I woke up one day during my healing process, and I was like, you know, that always felt good when she called me JJ. And so even though she was the only one in my life, and unfortunately she's not alive today to know that, but I believe she's here in spirit. I believe that right. she. She knows that uh, that that is my nickname today, and uh, it feels good. And uh, Bron was able to realize that uh, she came up with her own nickname, and she nicknamed herself uh, BJ. And uh, so she's now starting to, uh, I believe, um, you know, take care of her inner child that way, and be able to have those intimate conversations and and work herself off the ledge when she is uh, when she goes to that moment of fear or anxiety or worry. Good. And, uh, That's awesome. Well, yeah, it's, it's interesting, actually. There's something I, I wanted to point out, if you don't mind. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. Um, but it's interesting that um, I find that most of the people um, that are drawn to this redefining masculinity, um, so far anyway, uh, identify as female. Um, and that's interesting to me. So I think... Uh, I think part of the reason for that right now, um, I feel, is is that it's all about creating those safe spaces with each other and connection, right? So if you can have a better understanding of, of what somebody else is going through, right, you're able to pre- provide a safe space for them. But it's, it's really interesting to me that most of the people so far um, have been female who have sought this stuff out. Um, most of my audience has been female. Um, the last couple of talks, it's been primarily a female audience. Um, not not to say that there haven't been men there, because there have been. But it's been interesting to me how much more accepted, and this kind of goes along with the redefining thing, more acceptable it is for people who identify as female to be emotionally expressive than it is for men to be emotionally expressive in a healthy way or in a intimate or endearing way. You use the word endearing. That's not a word that you hear a whole lot of men use, right? That's interesting to me, so yeah. So let me ask you, uh, Greg, do you feel like uh, like you're less masculine today because uh, you have worked really hard to change your behaviors and how you treat yourself and how you treat others in your relationships? That's a great question, no. Uh, I feel the exact opposite. In fact, I feel I feel much more in tune with myself. Mm. I feel much more in tune with my truth. I feel much more open, honest. Um, I feel more powerful. I feel more in control. Uh, I feel stronger, and I feel far more courageous than I've ever felt in in my life. So no, not at all. Hmm. Hmm. So would you say that it's the balance of I, I my understanding is that you know we we have 
both the feminine and the masculinity within ourselves. Yeah. And and some of us tend to um, let's say kind of lean more towards masculinity or femininity within ourselves and and in our lifetime. And so, do you think it's more about that? When we were we were so heavy heavily weighted on on the masculinity um, hormones and all that you know that how we used to behave let's say and, and where we're at today and how we are leveling out do you think that there's we're just leveling out our and we're just more in touch with is it a, is it a mindful thing is it a chemical thing is it again does the mindful lead to a, a physical shift and change in our body? Is there yeah. a physical shift and change, or does it all come from mindfulness well, and consciousness? I think. I think. First off, I think it's important for for me to 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 express that I feel like gender is a construct. Um, I feel like it's something that we've created as a as a species. Um, my core belief system is is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, so things like gender are fluid. Things like you know, I identify as as like I said, I I'm a cisgendered male, which means that I like I said at the top of this, I identify with the the as male. That's the way I was born. That's the genitalia that I was born with. But not everybody is like that, right? Um, and, and not everybody does identify that way. So I think gender is a construct. It's also gender is also about connection. Um, you know, in in it's social. So it doesn't necessarily have to be black or white. It is about balance. It is about connection. It is about recognizing all aspects of our truth. And the more I step into those things, the more I step into my truth, regardless of what word I use. I just happen to call it redefining masculinity because frankly, I'm a man. And that's how I identify. So I call it that because that's my truth and that's where I'm coming from. That's my voice. But you could call it whatever you want. You could call it re redefining humanity. You could call it whatever. It doesn't matter. The fact is, is what I would love is to have a world where things like um, race, sexual orientation, don't play gender, don't play a role in how we communicate and connect with each other. That's what I would love to see, because then we're really about accepting and owning and loving the experience of being. Does that make sense? Does that does that answer the? I guess does that does that bring the point yeah. up and answer the question? Right. I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I I could keep going on this because this is a pretty powerful and strong subject for me. I I have a certain aesthetic. I have a certain look. Um, tattoos, piercings, beard, heavy metal shirts, rock and roll, all of that stuff, and I love all of that about me. But none of that makes me masculine. None of that makes me a man. What makes me a man is my choice. What makes me a man is my identity and the way I choose to express my truth. That's the way I feel about it. I love that. I love that because what you know, it's it's somewhat contradictory in the sense that. You describe your exterior self, how right. you pro how you have chosen to project yourself, and still do, um, from you know with that exterior shield, which which is your shield yeah. of protection. Absolutely, yeah. it is. It's, yeah, it is one hundred percent. It is uh, it is one hundred percent a shield of protection. I look a certain way. Um, and I've looked a certain way for a long time as a way to keep myself distance from other people. Um, and, and, and I've done that intentionally. Most people don't approach a bald guy with piercings and tattoos wearing a motorhead t-shirt on the street. They keep their distance from them because for whatever reason they make judgments and, and society tells us that that particular type of person you know, would rather punch you in the face than actually have a conversation with you or whatever it is. I'm not saying that that's true. I'm just saying that sometimes that could be the perception. So I think I've done, I know I've done it on purpose. But the interesting thing about that is I've changed none of this. Exactly. I've changed inside. I've changed, inside. I've changed my energy. I've changed my truth 
has come out and I've been more open and expansive with the way I love and the way I express that love. And that's the difference. That's what makes the difference. And that's the redefinition of masculinity as I see it for me. Because it takes more strength to give a man a hug in a room full of other men than it does to walk up and punch him in the arm and call him an idiot or call him a moron or tell him to shut the fuck up and get over it. It takes more strength to do that and tell him that you love him and that whatever he's going through is okay and acceptable and understandable than it does to take the traditional route, for lack of a better term. So, so do you find it conflicting for yourself when you look in a mirror? No. No, um, I find uh, I find that I enjoy the, the contrast. I enjoy the the uh, I own it and I accept it fully 100 um, percent. And I love it. I, I, I am starting. I won't say that I love myself fully because that's not true. Um, but I certainly do love myself more today than I did yesterday. Um, and the day before that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a journey, it's a process, it's organic, it's constant. And some days are better than others, as we all know. But for me, when I look in the mirror, um, I see acceptance, I see understanding, I see love and patience and kindness and giving. Um, and I also see somebody that wants to go bang his head at a rock concert and, and, and you know, do all, do some other traditionally masculine things. So, yeah. How um, how would you say today your relationships are with um, well let, let's start with Leanne I, I I know you mentioned it earlier in the show um, are there do you know when a let's say um, I'm gonna just for for the fun of it phrase it this way turn on your masculinity and don't want to turn it off and turn on your femininity. Like, how do no, you, how do you know? More, it's, it's far more fluid than that. I don't think it's ever, there's no switch. There's no, hey, I'm going to be a man today and I'm going to be not so much of a man tomorrow. I don't, I, I used to think that way in some ways. I used to step anything that I did that was remotely perceived as weak or vulnerable I would associate with the feminine aspect, right? So I would do everything I could to step away from that. But now I step into that because I don't associate that as masculine or feminine. I associate it as a human experience. Coming from love and kindness. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and sometimes, I, I, I'm in, sometimes I'm in fear, right? Sometimes I'm in reactive mode. I'm like, holy shit, what am I going to do here? I don't know what to do. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. So I withdraw and I go inside of myself. But again, that's not masculine or feminine. That's just me. Having being a human experience, yeah. Exactly. But the, and I don't, it's not, it's, it's, it's incredibly fluid. Like my hands are going crazy here, sorry. But it's incre yeah. it is very much an ebb and a flow and a give and a take. And it's about connection and understanding, in my opinion. And honesty and opening up and being expansive and loving. I love that because yeah, I, I've, I've been in conversations uh, with, let's say some women, for example, that say, you know, I, I want a man to be, I want a man to show his feelings. I want a man to, to be intimate. I want to be able to have a healthy, intimate relationship with a partner or my partner, my boyfriend or my husband. But there are times I want him to step it up and be a man. Right. You know, we've, we've heard that now, again, that whole, that whole statement that I just described is one that just perpetuates, I believe, the whole idea of the limited belief system of what truly defines a man's role in a relationship versus a woman's. I and agree. That is, that is contradictory to what you just described, which is it's not about, you know, uh, manning up or, you know, showing your feminine side. It's just a matter of just being coming from uh, that space of love and kindness and respect, ultimate right. respect first and foremost for yourself. Right. I think, I think, what I hear when I hear that phrase, what I used to hear was, okay, get over it, stop being emotional and do something about it. That's what I used to hear. Now what I hear is, okay, so the expectation is um, I need to step into my emotions, 
embrace them and give them a voice and work from a place of balance and healthy control, right? So that's what I hear when I when that's what I hear when those things are said to me now. When somebody says, and I, I don't I can't remember the last time somebody said be a man to me, to be honest. Because again, that's not what I'm manifesting into my life. What I'm manifesting is healthy create spaces that are about connection and understanding and existence and being. So but having said that, there is that dance that happens. There is that, you know, um that that aspect of, you know, I want to be taken care of, or I want to feel secure, or I want to feel comfortable, right? With with you being strong enough. But what does strength mean? What does that really mean? Like be a man, what does that mean? Well, I am a man, I'm being a man right now. I'm standing in front of you. I'm talking with you right now, Jay, and other people are listening as a man. So I am being a man, right? And that's yes. where that stops for me. The rest of that, from that point on, is about owning and embracing and loving myself and the people that, that I'm with and, and, and the experience that we're having. So my point being is where I'm going with this, Greg, is I think that there's an opportunity for us as a society, globally speaking, not just for men to redefine what masculinity means, but I think it's for all of society. It's not just, it's not just for us as men, I want to acknowledge and thank Michael Cameron, another man who is redefining masculinity up in the country of Canada. He's right by your side doing the same kind of work you're doing. Right. And uh, you know, you know what just struck me right now? I I want to do a show with the three of us together. <laughs> I think we should get. Yeah, that would be and, fun. I've had, I've had a few Michael. brief conversations with Michael, and he's he's a really interesting guy, and we've definitely connected on some stuff. So absolutely, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. I'd let's do that in the new year. But uh, getting back to my point, and I also want to acknowledge um, my spiritual mentor, Dwayne Orlando Hill, uh, is coming in from uh, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri area, I believe. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And there's been a there's a number of people that have jumped on that uh, haven't been on in a while. So thank you for being here. But yeah, I, I, I guess going back to the, the, my point is that it's not just for us as men having to redefine masculinity, but as a society, I, I think that both men and women, we contribute to a, a limited belief system of what our roles are supposed to be, how women are supposed to behave and how men are supposed to behave. And at the end of the day, they really, in my opinion, it, it shouldn't be how men and women are supposed to behave. It's how we are supposed to behave as human beings. We all, exactly. we all are human beings having having an experience and right. coming from love and kindness and compassion and empathy. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that's the core of, of I mean, I'm starting, I'm, I'm saying redefining masculinity because that's my framework. Right. That's where I'm at, right? Mm -hmm. I can't say let's redefine femininity because I don't know that. I don't know that framework. That's not what I'm intimately familiar with. Right. What I am intimately familiar with is masculinity and what was taught to me that masculinity was supposed to be, which are those be a man things that you talked about, right? And yeah. they're not bad things. They're not inherently wrong or evil or unhealthy. It's the interpretation that we have of them and the expectation that we place on them that becomes dangerous. And, and in my opinion, it becomes harmful right you know yeah. it it leads to very harmful behaviors if we're not if i'm not finding a way to express myself emotionally even if i'm angry if i'm pissed off and i want to express that i'm pissed off and i say i'm pissed off because of this this and this that's way different than punching something yeah right yeah yeah let me let me share this with you greg i i live in a in a complex here a community that uh in the last two weeks I have uh, been witness to domestic abuse, um, domestic violence taking place right here in my community. And uh, one guy was arrested, taken out in restraints. Another one, I could not locate which apartment it was coming from, but this woman was screaming and begging and crying. And it happened, I believe it was either Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, and I couldn't, I couldn't figure out which apartment was coming from, and and so 
I just find it so disturbing because it is so prevalent right here. I don't have to go far. I don't have to go. It, 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 there is no socioeconomic uh, space where it doesn't take place. It doesn't matter yeah. if you got no money or you got money or if you got a little bit of money. Um, abuse, yeah. and abuse and it's happening because people are in pain. Yep. And I agree completely. How, how to uh, how to start the healing process as you have done so eloquently. Thank you. I, uh, I want to share with you that we are we are running uh, close to the hour. Okay. We're coming up to eight o'clock here in uh, Mountain Time. I would like to ask you at this time um, if you could be so kind to share with us perhaps some closing thoughts on if there is anything that you could maybe uh, say that may inspire either people that are uh, struggling with, uh, let's say, uh, emotions that are uh, masculinity, that, for example, that is that is mischanneled and is being misused in, abu in an abusive way today. And or if people, if women and or men are in relationships where they are struggling in that regard, what would be your words of wisdom that you could share with them tonight? Two things. First off, whatever you're feeling is okay. Whatever I feel in any given situation is okay. That's the first thing. And I'm just going to leave that there because I think, yeah, I'm just going to leave that there. The second thing is choose love and understand that it is a conscious choice. It is a mindful decision to choose love. It is a mindful choice. So if you're if you accept it, you face it, you embrace it and you give it a voice. But you choose love every single time and and it's hard. Sometimes it's the hardest thing to do because you're so reactive and so afraid. And sometimes I feel like no matter what I do, it's the wrong thing. I even said that the other day in relationship to 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 my kids. Um and it wasn't the wrong thing, but that's how I was feeling in the moment. And that was okay, right? I accepted it, I faced it, and I gave it a voice. And by giving it a voice, I was able to process through it my way and in my terms and in my truth. So whatever you're feeling is okay. And it doesn't matter if it's anger, it doesn't matter if it's fear-based, it doesn't matter, it's okay. Um, uh, and just choose love as much as you possibly can in every situation make that choice i'd like to add a third a third comment sure which is um both you and i have acknowledged that we have spent a lot of time investing in ourselves to get to where we are today yeah we don't we just can't choose love like a light switch it, it's not that simple i don't believe it is i, I believe that if you are struggling with um, directing your emotions in a healthy way mm -hmm. and uh, and you're struggling in your relationships and all your relationships are damaged, including yeah. the most important one, with is, which is with yourself, yep. you gotta get help. You've gotta yeah, seek absolutely. help. Yeah, absolutely, Jay, you're right. And you know what? I, of course, you're right, and absolutely. I uh, kind of got caught up in the moment there, so, but yeah, you're right. It's you need to get help and that, you know, like you said, we didn't get here simply by just waking up one day and flipping a switch. Um, right. it, it does take work. It does take um, mindfulness. Um, you have to be active in your recovery. You have to be active in your life and in your well-being. So absolutely. Getting help is, is paramount. And, and the help I'm talking about, it's not one dimensional. I'm not saying, you know, go see a therapist. I might say not to see a therapist. They work. <laughs> there are so many different options and choices available today. Yeah. And there isn't one thing that's worked or it hasn't worked. It can be a potpourri. It can right. be a contrast. It, there's so much information available, available through social media today that doesn't cost you money. There are these types of shows that open our hearts and open our minds to thinking, to maybe exploring that there are new possibilities for ourselves. There yeah. are there are teachers that are available online, mentors. There there are therapists. There are books. There are Kindles. 
there are there's just so much available uh there are people like yourself and i that are out here advocating for men and women uh, you're doing your work i i do my work michael cameron's doing his work uh david strickel i could just keep going down a the list there's so many men that are stepping up and stepping out today um men that have come from uh that space of total masculinity and uh unhealthy thoughts and behaviors and today you know there are so many options and choices and places where if if you want to start to begin to open up your heart and your mind and and your soul that it's possible that you can change and you can become the best version of yourself because ultimately you're already there the best version of yourself is already there it's within you right we just got to be feel safe to be able to start to understand that we could let ourselves out i agree well said yeah so uh we are at this point my friend where uh it's time for us to uh wrap this show up and uh, i want to again thank you so much for for showing up tonight for yourself and for others and uh sharing the work that you're doing and your authenticity and the vulnerability that you shared your honesty and truths about your own childhood and uh how it affected your life and i so much appreciate you and and want to honor you in this moment for um for being you thank you and so much to me it just hits my soul and it shows me that that there is hope you know we can heal our perspective every day right we just have to be willing to show up for ourselves and i agree thank you i'd love thank to you. have you back in the new year we're going to get michael cameron and you and i into the studio <laughs> we're going to have a power hour of uh, <laughs> three men redefining what masculinity means today in the society that we all come from and live in and i'd like to wish you to have a beautiful happy new year and it's it's so nice to meet your significant other Leanne tonight and i'm so happy that uh, the two of you have are navigating this journey together that you feel you've created a safe space for both of you to learn yeah. how to have a healthier relationship one that you haven't been able to have before All right And, uh, Absolutely. Uh and I'll just say thank you. I I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um I really enjoyed myself. You're right. The hour went by quickly. So there's that. Um And yeah, no, it's been it's been a pleasure. Um and to everybody that's been watching and listening and stuff, I really appreciate each and every one of you uh for taking time out of your very busy days to to share this time with me and with with Jay. So thank you very much. And Jay to you, I appreciate you immensely. Um thank you for the opportunity and for taking the time. I know it's a Thursday thing instead of a Friday thing, so I appreciate you uh working with my schedule as well. So thank you very much sir. I uh uh, uh I definitely appreciate you immensely. So thank you. One last question or request I do have for you actually Greg is that whether it be tonight or tomorrow if you could take some time just to go back into the show on Facebook and respond to some of the questions and comments and acknowledge those that have uh that have participated in the show we've got there's been a lot of posts uh a lot of activity tonight and i am so grateful for those of you that joined us and uh that have contributed uh to this to the show tonight and so oh. yeah i will uh, I'll, i'll definitely make space uh to be able to do that over the next few days all right thank you so much for joining us on real men real talk raw we'll see you next week and uh, have you. a beautiful weekend take care namaste